Welcome to the ATS Symposium, Challenging Cases and Hallway Conversation, sponsored by Medtronic. My name is Peter Kapitän, I'm a Chief Medical Officer for Cardiac Surgery, Mechanical Circulatory Support, and Structural Heart. Together, I'm here with uh, Dr. Gaurav Halewani from the University of Michigan, Dr. Bill Brinkman, Heart Hospital, Baylor Plano, Plano, Texas, Dr. Mark Moon from the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, and Dr. Vivek Rao from Toronto General Hospital. We have all get, gotten used to this kind of Zoom meetings, but what we're missing from the meetings is the hallway conversation. Often you meet a colleague of you in the hallway and you discuss a difficult case that you have encountered in your own hospital and you like to get an opinion of a colleague. And so actually that is what we're going to do today. We have these four people that will comment on the cases and the first one will be presented by Dr. Mark Moon and the second one by Vivek Rao. So Mark, can I ask you to present the first case? Yes. yes, perfect. Good. Okay. Well, I'm going to present the case of a, a 28-year-old woman who presented with a three-week history of fever and chills. She came into the emergency room with right chest pain and was also short of breath with some dyspnea and exertion. She had no past medical history, nothing whatsoever. She did have a habit of uh, intravenous uh, drug use. On a physical exam, her heart rate was 116. Blood pressure was 95 over 60. She was a small woman with a BMI of 20, a normal size. She had very bad dentition, uh, presumably as a result of her uh, uh, social history. She had a systolic murmur, some abdominal swelling and some pedal edema. We had a CAT scan initially that showed a bunch of uh, cavitary lesions in her lung, you can see on the right. Um, we got a transesophageal echocardiogram, hold on. There we go. See if we can run that. Let me interrupt you here, Mark. I'd be interested yeah. in, in the panel's uh, thoughts here. So again, very common scenario. We see IV drug abuse with right-sided lesions um, with septic emboli to the lungs. Um, how fastidious are you in having the sepsis resolved um, before intervening on the valve? Or are you willing to go into the operating room, fix the valve in the setting of active infection in the lungs? Well, I, I think I'll start and say, I, I think you can sometimes just treat these patients for months on end, really, uh, with antibiotics. Um, and the, there's a lot of data that shows that the incidence of recurrent embolization goes down dramatically after a week or two of antibiotics, even if there is a vegetation still present on the, on the valve. And we've all had patients that we've treated medically just because they were poor risks for placing a valve or, um, that... We treated for, uh, medically for months and then they come back six months later, they're no longer using intravenous drugs. And so we take them for an operation and they still have a mass on their valve or in, in their uh, right atrium, but it's not infected anymore. It's just a, a clean mass. I don't know anyone else's thoughts. Yeah, I think a lot of times there's no urgency for the most part. Um, you know, the, the, I think it's important to try to treat Outside, uh, sources outside the heart. So if they have uh, a cavitary lung lesion that actually could be drained, many of them can, as like the, the CT that Mark showed, there's just, you know, lots of little things that, that probably can't be treated of them with antibiotics, but I don't think there's quite as much of an urgency that many of the, not many of these patients are not dying of right-sided heart failure, although occasionally some, some are struggling. So let me ask the ethical question then. So I, I agree with Mark exactly what we would do. We would treat you know, for a prolonged period of antibiotics, reassess the valve. And oftentimes, as you said, both the mass and the, and the TR goes away, and then you just leave them on that. But let's assume that they still have severe TR or a residual mass, and they're still using IV drugs. Would you take them to the operating room knowing that they're at risk for reinfecting, or would you say, I'm not operating on you unless you clean your act up? Well, I... I, I uh... I don't have a problem with taking a patient or to the operating room uh, who's got a history of IV drug use. Um, you know, it, it, it's a challenge. And obviously we, we deal with it in the mitral position all the time or the aortic, specifically the aortic position. If, if an IV drug user comes in with aortic uh, dis valve destruction, you really can't wait. I mean, you have to operate ultimately, but it, it is a ethical issue. I guess the real question is, would you reoperate on them if you've done something and then they come back a month or two later with a reinfection because they've um, 
Um, yeah, I think that's the real discussion point, right? I mean, what what how what can you do at least to have a conversation with the patient or a quote unquote contract with the patient because they're all using drugs at the time they present, right? right? And they all tell you that they'll stop, right? But how do we? I mean, what really lacks is there isn't really a lot of good drug rehab programs out there, particularly for these patients. And many of them are not insured. And if there was, they couldn't get in and, you know, yada, yada, yada. So, so that's, that's the, you know, how upfront can we be and how much do we hold patients to that? If they say I will not use, and you know, if it gets infected, I agree that I'm not going to get an operation. You know, we can have those conversations, but the reality is when you see a patient six months or 12 months afterwards and they are reinfected, and of course they reused at some point, that's the real ethical dilemma, whether they sign something or not. You yeah, know, you still feel and often we facilitate it because we do our operation and ID service says they need six weeks of antibiotics. So you put a pick line in and you send them home with easy IV access. So, you know, it, it's not surprising that there's a high recidivism. So in Canada, do they send them send IV drug users home with a pick line? We do. We do. Wow. Yeah, we've we've set up an arrangement with our hospitalist service that uh, if we have a patient that's that exact same scenario. They go to a specific portion of the hospital. It's kind of a step down nursing home type ward uh, for six weeks. Yeah, we're, I'm, I'm a little gun shy about sending them home with a line. What about you, Gore? Uh, we don't. Yeah. yeah. No, it's interesting because uh, you know there there are some practices that are evolving and starting to study whether six weeks of IV antibiotics are needed, or if they could do a shortened course of IV and switch over to an oral uh, regimen for the remainder. And that's, I know, something that Vinay Badwar has been working on with the NIH to see if there could be a, a trial in that way. Yeah, that, that'd be very important, I think, because occasionally you get somebody who is three or four weeks in and they're, they're gonna leave the hospital no matter what, and we don't want them leaving with that line in. Right. And so we've gone to the, the, the infectious disease and say, you gotta come up with something for us. If you want them to get six weeks of antibiotics, they're not going to get it intravenous. Come up with a plan. So I, I, you can't sit on your service and take up a bed. I mean, all those things are real challenges. Right. What yeah. would you do in, in Texas, uh, Bill? Well, I would just say, I don't think it's fair that the sur cardiac surgeon, everything gets put on him or her. You know, I think this is a mental health issue question. I think, so we have a team, you know, and, and um, which involves, healthcare, uh, internal medicine, also psychology. And if you have, you really have to have a team around this. Cause I think it, it, you know, it's a hard decision just to put it off on the attending cardiac surgeon, whether you're going to operate or not. I mean, I think, um, and I think there's been some articles published in New England journal discussing these team approaches and that's what we've tried to do, but mental health resources, in the United States are not the best. I mean, this is a terrible mental health problem. Someone's willing to stick a needle in their arm and put dirty stuff in there. It's mm -hmm. just bizarre. So we, we can fix the heart, but the mental health issue, we got to have a t separate team for that. Yeah, we don't have any sort of uh, divisional policy or sectional policy as to what to do with these types of patients. It, I leave it to every one of our own surgeons to make their own decision. If they're not comfortable uh, operating on a recidivist, then they can ask one of their partners to see them if they want. And so we all have a different approach, but I think it's... Uh, uh, we don't really have a policy. There, there is an article in, in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery by Robert Said, um, uh, particularly around this issue. And that actually as a surgeon, you're not allowed to make a decision. Oh, I'm not going to operate. You're now here back for the third or fourth time. You should still intervene if the patient promises to um, stick to the rules. And every time they can violate it, but um, it's hard for a surgeon then to say no. And maybe the team approach that Bill just mentioned might be a good one, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think, you know, that I, I, I'm familiar with the article you're talking about. And I, I think that's putting too much pressure on us. I, mm -hmm. I think we have to be able to make our own decisions, um, obviously, in conjunction with discussions with the patient. But forcing a surgeon to take one approach versus the other, I think, is, is not right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's look at this echo. It, in this particular patient, we can see the uh, tricuspid valve with a vegetation with some severe uh, regurgitation. And uh, on this view, uh, it appears that uh, the, the mass is on the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. And we can see that also in the 3D image 
the anterior leaflet appears to be more affected than the others. Yeah. So if it, what we have here is a 33 year, or I forgot how old she was. She, she just got five years older in my two right. slides. <laughs> a lot of medical management. Exactly. Yeah, that's a, a long course of antibiotics. Hey, you know what? This is exactly the hallway conversation because we might, <laughs> might, not, might not remember in 33, 33, I don't know. Remember, like, Something like that. Really vex you. Yeah. Right. But you know, she's in pretty bad right heart failure. Um, she's got positive blood cultures, MSSA, severe tricuspid regurgitation. So we talked about medical therapy. Let's say su surgical therapy. Let's say we're going to um, uh, consider surgical therapy. What? Let's just say she the take the IVDA out of the equation. What are your guys' thoughts about timing for a tricuspid uh, procedure? Do, like Viv said, should we do it right away? Should we wait? What would you do, uh, Gorov? Yeah, I guess I, I would uh, essentially once they're I feel like there's reasonable source control outside of the tricuspid valve. If if we made the decision, the commitment to operate, you know, if there's still ethical questions, different scenario. If we made a decision that we are going to treat them with surgery, then when I feel like we've treated everything outside of the heart as best we can, you know, whether there's an abscess that's been drained, um, there are obviously going to be small um, uh, infections and pulmonary issues that you're not going to get over. So I, I then proceed probably a little earlier. Any other bill, bill what would you do? Yeah, I think we, you know, we frequently will tune these patients to try and get their right ventricle as good as we can. And then, you know, we'll proceed if, if we made a decision to proceed. So yeah, same in I'll Toronto. If you're, you're yeah, I was just going to say it also depends on, on what you're dealing with. I think if it's isolated tricuspid, um, you know, we'd be a little bit more aggressive at going in, um, again, as we have source control. I think if you're looking at a common scenario where you have an aortic lesion with a kissing lesion on the mitral and you're looking at doing a double valve intervention, then for sure we're going to make sure there's source control. The last thing you want to do is go back in to do a double valve redo. Um, so uh, it's more important to have uh, source control when you're looking at a bigger operation up front. Well, well let's check some labs. We forgot to do that. She's 24 weeks pregnant. Uh, oh. Now, what are we going to do? Does that change the equation? Um, I guess so, Bill. What? You, you said she's in right side of heart failure, right, Mark? I mean, yeah, pretty the question severe. is how medical, how much medical therapy will she tolerate? Can she, can she get another, you know, 10 to 12 weeks, which is a long time and depending on how this medical therapy is going. Yeah, or you could wait at least a couple of weeks. The, the, like 30 the weeks you can wait the better it is for the baby, isn't it? Uh, I'd get the OB service involved and figure out what's the chance of the fetus even surviving the next six weeks with active IVF MSA and right heart failure. And yeah. I'm probably going to say it's a very low, low viability fetus, and they would recommend termination now, and then that allows you to go ahead. Yeah. Obviously, she wanted to keep the baby. And um, uh, at sort of all cost, um, so our approach was exactly that, to try to control the right heart failure, which we did with some uh, pretty extensive diuresis. Uh, and we were able to wait, uh, I think we waited about six weeks, mm -hmm. uh, 10 weeks, actually. So she made it to 34 weeks, got her teeth all pulled out in the meantime. Uh, we did uh, a C-section first, uh, but we were ready to do surgery if, if things went bad. Uh, we did it in the in the cardiac operating rooms at C-section, uh, and then uh, five days later we took her after we diuresed her more for tricuspid valve repair. Uh, I got a I got a video of it. Um, I'll just kind of I can scan through it a little bit. But we we took so, took off some native pericardium and uh, uh, tanned it. Uh, we like to put it on a like a piece of paper and clip it there so it doesn't get all wrinkled up in the in the uh, the tanning bucket. Um, we opened up, obviously, and here's the vegetation. You can see it was on the anterior leaflet. The, the, the septal and, and posterior leaflets looked completely clean. Uh, that's a posterior leaflet there. Let me interrupt you there for a second, Mark, and ask the other panelists, how many people tan their autologous pericardium? We don't anymore. We just use fresh. You don't treat it with glutarol height, uh, Viv? No, we don't. We don't either. But I, I still question about the longevity of any of these, whereas native, bovine, you know, all the different 
choices that we have. We've obviously, some of us have been burned by the core matrix experience. So, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if we still have a good solution. Part of it, it's hard to study long-term, right? These are long-term outcomes and we don't follow patients like that after hatch repair. Well, since Gorab brought it up, I'll, I'll tell you that on the tricuspid side, the core matrix is actually a very good option, especially when there's no leaflet tissue at all. And then some of these where you're looking at people who had remote endocarditis and they're coming back because they developed right heart failure three, four, five years later, and there's, it's basically laminar TR and you've got nothing to augment. Um, doing the tubes works well, and I've got two patients now out five years, and uh, their tubes look great. We've had the same issues using core matrix on the left side, so I would be cautious using in the mitral position. <laughs> But on the right side, it seems to be a, a very good alternative. Yeah, I you think may need this... to share that experience because I, I've reviewed papers. I've personally had experiences, not as not, we, haven't, we haven't used it a lot, but one or two times, and it has not held the test of time. Mm. We've, we've yeah. just switched to a cardio cell, which is, you know, I started using it with the Osaki technique, and uh, we've had good results with that. I haven't done a lot of Osaki's recently because it's complex. But with valve leaflet repair, I haven't been disappointed with the cardio cell. I think, you know, in, in this particular case, we're not really looking like the, the, we talked yesterday about the aortic valve and what we got to give the patient a lifetime solution. I don't think we're working on a lifetime solution here. We're trying to work on a, a solution that will uh, get us uh, a, a good handful or two handfuls of years before uh, this patient will need the next procedure. So we put a, we reconstructed that anterior leaflet. And then of course we put in a couple of Gore-Tex cords into the uh, papillary muscles where we had resected off the anterior leaflet, then bring the, those through the edge of the edge of the um, edge of the uh, patch. Yep. And then of course, here's another, here's another question before I do it. Do we need to support this repair? Do we need to put a, a a ring in. What about a pericardial? I know the Cleveland Clinic showed the pericardial uh, band in the uh, uh, tricuspid position is not a great long-term solution either. What? What? No, would I, I think. I think. I think you need to support this because of, of any valve. I think the tricuspid band is the most likely to dilate. So I would support this 100. percent Would you put a ring in the Gorov? Yeah, I think at this point. I mean, it's. Um, I, I think your risk of in reinfection is high no matter what. Or if, if they don't, if they're still using, you don't put a pr prosthesis in. I think there's still a risk. Now we think that ova that the pericardium is safe, but there's still going to be some TR, and I think it's going to be less when you when you put a ring in. So we, I, that's we just in my approach. We don't have any data though. I mean, could you consider like I remember operating with Dr. Cohn. He used to stick a. Uh, a a syringe down in there and do a de Vega yeah. style and he would just right. totally obliterate the posterior leaflet. And then you'd be just dealing with the septal and the anterior leaflet and not, I mean, and then if you supported that, I mean, I think this is a more elegant repair, but you might be able to get away with just obliterating the space that the posterior leaflet normally takes up. Yeah. If you're, if you're lucky enough that the infection is only on the posterior leaflet, you basically do a bicuspidization and you do like the old fashioned K repair. Um, I still support those with an anaplasty band, but it, it works very well because you don't need that posterior leaflet. I don't think there's any issue if you don't, though, right? I mean, the reality is this this patient's not done. <laughs> They're going right. to get another operation. Yeah, and I think, you know, Bobby Robbins, when, uh, when I was at Stanford, he was uh, one of our faculty, and he, he said the patient has got to take some responsibility for their own care. So, you know, we we have to trust the patient that hopefully – you know, do the right thing, whether they're going to is uh, to be determined. Uh, but, uh, you know, you got to give them the shot. Yeah. So Mark, that was a beautiful repair, by the way. Yeah. Congratulations you. to you. One thing maybe you can teach us is how do you end up sizing it, right? Because you, you, you got to put more than just the size of the anterior leaflet. Um, and because, and you want to account for the coaptation length. So tell us in your thought process and how you oversized yeah. it by how much and how far back you put your your cords into the uh, edge of the, the leaflet as well. Yeah, I, um, I now when there's no anterior leaflet to size because you've cut it all out, that's a little bit different. But uh, uh, the way I usually size a tricuspid ring is to pull down uh, the anterior and posterior leaflet and size it 
to both of those leaflets together. You don't want to size it just to the anterior leaflet, that'd be too small. And, um, uh, but the anterior and posterior leaflets together will, will make uh, the size correct. How do you uh, size the patch though? Oh, the patch. Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 that's a challenge too. So what we did was we put the patch in and, and um, uh, then shaped the cords and, and put them in such a position that we could add more cords if we wanted to. So we put them back mm, probably a centimeter back from where we thought the patch would need to be, then did a, a, a water test. And if we wanted to put them um, closer to the edge, we could add some more cords. It's, it's, uh, it's Roughly an how idea. many cords you end up putting in? Because you had to I, support the entire length, essentially. Right. And in, in, in that patient, it only took three cords, and that was able to take care of it. But uh, we got lucky with putting it in the right spot the first time. That's the art of surgery there. It's hard to describe. Yeah. Yeah. That's Great. Job. Well, thanks very much. How long is she now out of, uh, how long, much follow up do you have from this patient? Mark? Yeah, yeah. She, uh, uh, that was during mid, mid of COVID. So right. um, her and the baby are fine, as okay. far as I know. She hasn't come back, knock on wood. Perfect. Great. Well, congratulations. Excellent. Well done. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. And we're going to the next case then, uh, Dr. Viv Rao from Toronto. Uh, you have an interesting case as well to discuss. Yeah, so if I can get the slides up, Robert. Uh, once again, thanks uh, to the panel for uh, joining me here. This is great to be in such an illustrious group and thanks McDonald for putting this together. And I agree with what Peter said at the outset that we, I personally really miss the hallway interactions and, and even just the discussion sections that we have in our meetings. Somehow it's just not the same over Zoom. Um, there's going to be a little bit of overlap with the discussion we have here with Dr. Brinkman's case, but uh, I'll think I'll try and make it a little bit different. Um, next slide, Robert. So this is probably going to be a very common um, situation that you guys are going to see in your clinics. So this is a 67-year-old gentleman, had a previous uh, bypass in 2007. At that time, he had a lead of the LAD, a reader to the right, which has subsequently occluded, um, and a saphenous vein graft to his first obtuse marginal. His comorbidities included a bilateral carotenosis less than 50%. Interestingly, he had an occluded right common femoral artery, but the left side was, was fine. And certainly from an access point of view, our TAVI team felt that that was adequate. Um, he presents with exertional dyspnea and uh, the echo shows severe bicuspid aortic stenosis, preserved LV function, and you can see the calculated valve error is 0.6. Um, couple things to discuss here. Um, and I always make this comment to our fellows, which you don't see in the textbooks anywhere. But the first question I always ask is, who did the first operation? And in this particular case, you know it's going to be a nightmare re-op. You know the lead is going to be right in the middle uh, of, the, of the sternotomy. It's going to be at risk for injury. You know that it's going to be a ton of adhesions. And it really makes a difference in our mind as to who did the first operation, whether we tackle a re-op or we push them towards TAVI. Um, and I, I sort of say this in tongue in cheek, but as you get older and you start having patients come back for reoperations, if you get a call from your partner saying, oh, Mr. Smith came in um, and needed a reop and I took him to the operating room, you know you're doing a good job. When they say Mr. Smith came in and he needs a reop, uh, can you look after him? You know that nobody wants to do your redo. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we was learned this that your own time. redo? This was, was this not my own? redo. This was not my redo. <laughs> and uh, and as Tyrone always says, and he taught us from the beginning, is that whenever you do your operation, you got to prepare for the next operations. Unless the patient dies in your table, you got to prepare to come back. So everything we do is to prepare for the next operation. What do you um, think about that, Rita? What about that, Rita, the RCA? You know, we, this isn't a coronary session, but why, why is it down? I mean, those things are supposed to last forever, according to you know, John Puskas, Yeah, I don't think friend. I put the angiogram up on here. To be honest with you, the right didn't have significant disease even, you know, 13 years later. Ah, okay. So uh, I'm not sure why they use a read at that time other than just to do multiple arterial graphs. So I, I certainly would not have put an, uh, uh, an in situ uh, arterial graph. I probably wouldn't put a radial to it um, with what I saw from 2020. Okay. Um, so it's not surprising that the in situ read went down. Um, any comments about, again, we, we discussed this with Dr. Brinkman's case in terms of looking at the overall life expectancy of the patient. So he's now 67, previous bypass, um, did really well. He did, you know, 13 years coming to you with now with bicuspid aortic stenosis. Um, what would be your heart team thoughts? Yeah, I, so I, I, I know I've mentioned this before. It'd be great to have a lifetime calculator, right? What's the life expectancy 
of this patient. This patient is different from what we're going to hear from Dr. Brinkman's case. Um, he's around the same age, but has a lot more comorbidities. Clearly got coronary artery disease. He's got a fair amount of peripheral vascular disease, which to me, I, I'm thinking more, is he going to outlive a, a good valve that lasts 12 to 14 years? I'm, I don't know at this point, you know, that, that puts him basically at the life average life expectancy in North America, kind of in their early eighties. And you can argue that this 67 year old probably is sicker than kind of some of the average 67 year olds. Uh, and so that, you know, I, I'm not sure I worry as much about, is he going to outlive one valve? Another question that comes up in our clinic is access. So let's assume he had occluded bilaterally and you're not, you're not looking at transfemoral tavi anymore. Um, in our clinic, at least that really pushes you towards surgery because we just, do not like doing alternate access. Uh, and again, doing transcarotid here with its carotid stenosis is probably not great. Um, we would have talked about an axillary or direct aortic approach, but what about you guys? Are you sticking with transfemoral? And if it's not a transfemoral approach, going towards surgery? Uh, I'll, I'll start. Go ahead, Bill. Go ahead. I would just say we don't he really hesitate to do alternative access, especially because with the TVT registry, the, the outcomes with vascular complications is followed so closely and such an important quality indicator that we will do axillary and, um, and carotid. Um, we've kind of gone away from transapical and direct aortic, although we, we used to do a lot of that. Um, we, we, we tend to separate the decision for um, TAVR versus SAVR separate from the access, and then we decide, is this an alternate access or a uh, femoral candidate. Yeah, I think that I would just only add, you know, in the rare case that it's the only option is transapical, which nowadays doesn't really seem to be that frequent. It'd be a very unusual scenario. That might push us to consider an operation as a conventional surgical approach. Um, we've had very good success with, with uh, carotid, you know, you obviously you show bilateral carotid stenosis of less than 50. I presume that's internal carotid. You know, we really would need to see what the CT shows and maybe you're going to show that, but you know, the, the, the main body that carotid and you can actually a lot of times get the axillary artery right up, right up um, above the sternoclavicular notch without necessarily even um, having to cut any of the sternum. And, so, and of course the axillary, you of course want to be a little careful and make sure that that's large enough to, that are, that you're not going to, temporary include the lima or, or damage the subclavian, of course, those are some considerations, but, um, and those things in a rare case might push it, but we're very quick to, to use alternative access if needed. You know, yesterday, yesterday, Bill presented a case of a, a, a similar age patient, and we were talking about the operative risk. What was it? 2%, right? That's the calculated STS operative risk. Well, we, t we, we also said that that patient probably had a 0% operative risk because mm -hmm. it's patients like this that are so shown, thrown into the same equation. This patient is not that patient. They don't have the same operative risk. This one is probably the one that makes the operative risk predicted higher. So that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is a challenging case. Absolutely. So is yeah, there really still an issue about that. durability, Bill? Would, would you still think, okay, the 67 year old, Davi, we don't know durability, or is that not something you take into account? I mean, my bias is the durability of a well-placed surgical valve in a properly sized TAVR valve is similar. I mean, that's my bias. I don't know if the data would show that yet. I think one missing thing for me is just, I'd really want to look at the aorta. I'd want to look at, because many times I'd, I get these patients who've had cabbage before and they've left behind a 4.6 centimeter root or things like that that might change my thinking, or if the origin of the brachiocephalic vessels have disease, you know, it might make me shy away from a carotid approach. Those are things that I'd really want to see. So just, I didn't want to steal a lot of thunder from your case, Bill, so I didn't want to do too much on the, uh, on the discussion. We can go to the next slide, Robert, show the echo. Uh, we had a brief discussion about the calcium burden. Um, so this is the uh, transthoracic, oh, just stay there. Yeah, there's the thoracic echo. So you can see it's a bicuspid, heavily calcified valve. And like I mentioned um, with Bill's presentation, this one does have aortomitral continuation. Um, so there's significant calcium in the mitral junction. I'm not sure you can read it, but the, um, the annular measurement there is 2.3 centimeters. Um, and the eighth ending aorta is not dilated. But, but it looks like the calcium is, is going up 
uh, in the ascending order, isn't it? It is. It's, it's going all the way up uh, to the STJ. It involves both cusps. It involves the anterior mitral leaflet curtain. This is the whole pretty much fibrous going of the heart. They're getting calcified. So change the thinking or, or Mark? Well, I think if, if this patient goes to surgery, we're going to have to change our risk calculators moving forwards because yeah, right. we're not going to we're not going to have yesterday's case in our in our in our pile because they're all the easy ones are going to get taver and all the bad cases are going to get open surgical intervention. Yeah. So uh, uh, you hit the nail yeah. on the head, Mark. That's absolutely right. Yeah. I, I guess let me ask this. I mean, I think you certainly painted a picture that a lot of surgeons out there would first favor taver as a strategy first, unless something in the workup proves that otherwise is not safe. Um, and let's say you're thinking TAVR, is there a valve choice that you're thinking about um, between a balloon expandable versus a self-expanding? And at least our bias would be a self-expanding for the reasons that you have mentioned, uh, you know, with, with the calcium, heavy, heavy calcium in the annulus itself, as well as the STJ. And I don't know the sizing, so I can't tell you exactly, but that's that's kind of the way I would be leaning towards. That's that's an that's an excellent point, and it's going to foreshadow what's going to happen next. But uh, Bill and Mark, what are your thoughts on balloon versus self-expanding? Well, I would say because you're alluding to calcium going down the order of mitral curtain, and that's a fragile area, and it's easy to push that calcium through and cause a perforation into the left atrium or even in the transverse sinus. We've seen that, so we would probably favor a self-expanding valve with embolic protection if we were going to do a TAVR on this case. Right. Um, Mark, and any full I don't do I don't do TAVRs, so I'm going to have okay. to defer to you guys. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good. Okay. So I'm not part of the TAVR team either, but you'll see why I got involved a little bit later. So uh, <laughs> next slide. <laughs> Excellent. But actually, this, this, this is an important point that both Mark and Viv just, Vivek just brought up. Should you guys be part of that team? Whether you're performing the procedure or not is a different scenario, but of the decision-making team. Decision. Because, because, because ultimately, you know, I, I think all of us are moving into this, this direction where we're becoming specialists in an area, you know, within, within cardiac surgery, within cardiac diseases. And we really should be able to offer all the therapies. And that includes the surgeons, the mitral surgeons. They should, I think they should learn how to do mitral clip and transcatheter yeah. mitral sure. uh, repair and replacement techniques. And I think aortic valve surgeons and aortic surgeons should be able to, to do this so they can own the complication and hopefully before the complication occurs and help make the right decision for the patient. Right. I, I, I agree with you moving forward. Absolutely. And and every single graduate nowadays has got to be uh, a transcatheter surgeon as well as an open surgeon. Um, I think Viv and I, I can probably ride out the next eight to 10 years without having to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but anybody coming up okay. now, I, I agree 100% with you, Gore. Well, to Gore's point, that's why you I guys go, will do all the endocarditis for us. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm part of the, the mitral team. Um, I don't do the mitral clips, but I'm part of the decision making to say, you know, come on, guys, that's a straightforward P2. You could have a minimally invasive mitral repair. That's what he should have and not a, not a mitral clip. Um, but uh, two of my junior surgeons do the uh, TAVI implant and they do the mitral clip. So, and it's a shared process. So, you know, if you have four or five cases booked for the day, then it alternates who the primary operator is, whether it's the interventional cardiologist or the surgeon. But I, I completely agree with you, Gaurav. I think going forward and for the junior faculty that are there, you better learn how to do percutaneous therapy because if you're going to be a mitral expert, you need to be able to offer the whole armamentarium of mitral interventions. So you made us curious of it. What, what happened? Well, so here's the, uh, can you, can you run the, the video there, Robert, um, on left-hand side? So you can see that it was a balloon expandable um, device that was put in. Just click on that. And uh, here's the autogram afterwards, hopefully. Let's see if you can just, uh, there you go. Yep, there. So it looks like it's in good position. You don't see a ton of AI. So everybody was happy until they um, noticed that he was in complete heart block. So uh, they had a pacer. Yeah, I'm but, curious, you know, did you do this? Uh, I know you didn't do this, but did you do this yeah. under uh, awake or under general anesthesia? This is awake. Awake with rapid pacing for this. And that's obviously what every place has gone to. 
Yeah. And I, you know, of course, when we do that, we find less pair of our leak, less everything, you know, everything yeah. outcomes look better because you're not looking as hard. There's no trans subject echo. Yeah. And I'm curious, um, you know, if that is good enough in a high risk patient, there are times in high risk patients, we intentionally put them to sleep. Let's say it's a very narrow landing zone, an AI case that's due in, of course, off label, but an AI case of previous freestyle or something like that. And getting that landing zone right is so critical. So we've actually done the opposite. We have put them to sleep to get every bit of information we can. Right. So I think that's a great point, Gaurav, because we're doing them awake. We, you know, you talk to the patient, they feel fine. Um, so you're, you got a sense of comfort that everything's great. You do the orogram that looks good. You do the quick surface echo in the, in the uh, MPOR, or multiple purpose or where these tabbies are done. If you can show the nest echo, Let's talk a little bit slide. more about doing them awake. Why? Wh what's the benefit in doing the surgery awake? When I when I had my wisdom teeth pulled, I was out. Believe me, I wasn't going to be awake for that. So why? Yeah, why you were awake for this? General anesthesia. So that is that's we're talking about the same thing. They're not awake. You know, they're under anesthesia. Right, right, right. Bill, do you want? I mean, you guys, I know we're pioneers in this, and the data on it is pretty strong for the patient benefit. I think that you know. <laughs> It gets the, the older patient not having a Foley, not having general anesthesia. They mobilize quicker, um, and they go home the next day. Initially, I was a skeptic, um, but probably 70% of our patients we do awake, and most of them are going home the next day if they don't have a rhythm problem. So it's also a cost more cost-effective, and our margins with TAVI or TAVR are so slight that um, prolonging the hospitalization takes away any value to the hospital. So that makes sense. Of course, of these patients, Mark, come to you, they're not getting surgery because they've got bad lungs and sure. you don't want to put them on ventilator. So it makes sense to do a- an There are some cabinet. places sending them home the same day Yeah, in the US, so. We've yeah, done that if they had a pacemaker in already or something, we usually watch them for a little bit though. And, um, so we want to play the echo, eh? Robert, can you play, play the echo, the right image? Yeah. Oh, this is what you want to look here. So in the, in the multi-purpose operating room, he was fine. He went back to the, the unit because he was uh, pacer dependent um, and they wanted to get a better echo on him. Again, he's awake. He's totally stable. Um, he feels fine. Uh, there's no effusion on this echo, but now you're seeing there is a paravalvular leak and there is a small aorta RA fistula. Would you ever consider putting a pacemaker in right there in the operating room while they're in heart block or does it come back often? It comes back often enough that we don't right away, but I'm happy to hear what the panel says. Yeah, we tend to, if, if, if uh, we can get AP, which usually we can, then they'll put it in then. Normally no, people would wait to, until the next day to make a decision, isn't it? It yeah, depends. I, yeah, I mean, if they're high risk, like if they have a preoperative right bundle or something, and then you, you know they're gonna be high risk for a pacemaker later, we might put it in that afternoon, but you know, we usually do wait till the next day. If, if we're talking about that's, that's part of it, if, if it's truly complete heart block, I don't think it's going to come back. If there's, it's a wanky block or, or it's maybe changed during the, this course and it's not clear, then I think you can certainly wait. And there are risk factors that are published right bundle, et cetera, that, that are yep. important. And again, this was a high risk TAVI with a very severe calcification. So I think the, the decision was, this was going to be complete permanent heart block they were going to go for a pacer. The, the issue now is you've got this pre presumed uh, annular rupture here. Patient's hematically stable. It doesn't look like the, the fistula is um, hematically significant, but how many of you would take them to the OR and fix this versus watch and wait? Who would we, fix it? <laughs> we've been in this situation a couple of times and we've, if the patient was sort of 88 year old, Cohort B kind of, you know, like definitely not a great open candidate. We would, we have watched it and they haven't, you know, always done so well. This guy's 67 and he's got a normal EF. I think we would just take him to the operating room. It, you know, not maybe in a rush, but we would, we would do an elective redo on him. Yeah. I guess how, how is he doing clinically, right? If they're, if he's truly asymptomatic, you can certainly watch and wait if, you know, I think that's probably the important piece of information you need to make that decision. But would you send him home, Gaurav, if he's, if he's stable? 
think you could. I mean, this this is in and of itself doesn't tell you enough information. I guess I I, I I'm, of course we'd be cautious by repeat imaging and things like that, um, and then make that decision based on that. Yeah. Mark, I was, limit, I was limited to four or five slides, so I couldn't show you all the, the cast okay. and everything else. Yes. But um, long story short, so again, to Bill's point, he's 67, normally F, otherwise uh, robust guy. Um, and we were not happy leaving him with this potential complication. Uh, the subsequent transesophageal echo showed that the uh, RA fistula was bigger than you see on the transthoracic here, um, and that there was a hematoma around the root. So that sort of forced our hand. So next slide there. So now the question is how do you fix this luckily enough in 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 this situation because it's a fresh implant the um the, the tabby valve was easy to pull out um but when you pull it out and some of you have been in this situation um you, you got a huge mess in the angles you got a huge hematoma everything is very friable um and nothing's holding sutures yeah i think so a lot you... of times in this scenario you're obligated to do a total route and you already described the calcium a bit uh, on that echo and the, the route up to the SCG sounds calcified. I'm thinking that it's very likely you're going to have to do an entire route. Yeah, as you said, the, the tissue quality is very poor. I think if you have a choice, of course, you'd always rather if you had to do a tab or explant, do it in a more chronic or subacute phase than an acute phase because typically the tissue quality is very different. Is the tricuspid okay? I mean, you, the member of septum is probably ripped to the heart with a flow into the right atrium and the heart block, that'd probably require a little bit of reconstruction there. I guess you don't need to worry about it too much if they're already in heart block, but I mean- Yeah, so luckily the tricuspid and the micro for that matter were okay. But when we got in there, there was just a lot of hemorrhage around the roots. So it was a root replacement. It was a significant patch, uh, pericardial patch repair um, around the annulus to put the sutures in. Um, and when we came off, um, you know, you're seeing some ejection here, but he had very poor EF. Um, and again, without only four slides to show you, uh, we ended up putting this guy on ECMO for 48 hours, um, to get him through all of this. Uh, but fortunately we, you know, he weaned off ECMO once all the swelling, I think he did have a component of some coronary obstruction because of the swelling from our patch as well as all the edema from the hematoma. And, um, you know, we didn't touch any of the graphs, so we were able to do all of this without uh, can you touching help the us graphs. Saying, so you had to patch and then do a total route? Or did you do it? Yeah, so, so route? basically we, 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 take out, we take out the valve, we take out all the calcium, and, you know, there was a whole hemorrhagic area there uh, in that aeromicral junction. So we took a patch down into the anterior mitral leaflet, very redundant, uh, and then brought it up um, into the non-coronary sinus, which was then sewn to the, the Dacron graft. Um, and then we put a pericardial valve in there. So um, that fixed the, the problem with the root and the valve, um, but he had a lot of edema. And I suspect in retrospect that even though he had a lima to the LAD, which was patent and a vein graft, he, he, he was dependent on some of his proximal perfusion, especially his right. And I think we compromised his RCA with the edema uh, from this hematoma. And then his, his RV was the one that was really uh, problematic and um, but it recovered within 48 hours. So it tells me that it was likely due to perioperative edema from this whole travesty. Whenever I'm doing a root in a situation like this, uh, where the root is a mess, uh, I always like to, to suture my uh, 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 valve up about a centimeter and a half on the tube so I can fold it over, have a skirt down there uh, of, of graft to suture into the annulus. I think it gives it a little bit of a shock absorber effect as opposed to sewing the sewing ring of the valve down in there, which is rigid. Yeah, I think mean, a freestyle too is soft and uh, we've used that sometimes because it, I think it goes to that same point that Mark's making. Um, yeah, for a standard, you know, biobental, it's exactly what we do. Here, the issue was also there was a fistula that we had to cover um, again with a lot of hemorrhagic tissue that you couldn't really identify. So the simplest thing to do is just put a large patch over everything um, and cover the, the potential defect. That's a great result with, great. with ECMO being used. Uh, remember 15 years ago, ECMO was only put on people who weren't gonna survive. And, and as opposed to AVRs, which are gonna have a higher risk coming down the road, I think ECMO has got a lower uh, mortality rate than it used to. And it's because we're much more 
aggressive to use it in borderline cases because we don't have all the complications we used to have. Right. Well, th this is a type of case that you, you've all been through where they've got a very hypertrophied LV, a small non-dominant right that you can't protect very well, and you come off and the LV is fine, but your RV is just toast because you didn't protect it very well. Um, and in the past, we would just limp for several days uh, with all the inotropes and nitric oxide. But now we just, with you know, a drop of a hat, okay, put them on ECMO for 48 hours and let the RV recover, and, and they tend to do very well. Right, as, yeah. As this guy did. Yeah, I mean, those old patients, we'd get them through the surgery, but then they'd go into renal failure and all sorts of other uh and this guy with his bad leg or bad circulation to his legs could have had problems down there too. Yeah. Yeah. He got lucky. He did well. Perfect case. Yeah. Great, great demonstration. Thanks very much. And uh, well, that brings us actually to the, to the end of the session. So the, the adhesions were, were okay. Uh, Viv? No, they were, te in fact, I think it took longer to get into the heart than it did to do the repair, but um, right. we, we got <laughs> right. through it. I remember when, when I was in training, my professor, and he was operating in, in a redo case, and he was shouting and screaming, he said, oh, who did the first operation, this crazy guy? Look up the report. And then one of the circulating nurses said, well, actually, professor, it was you who did the first case. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, of course, that can happen as well. <laughs> oh, Yeah, I'm convinced there's nothing we do to make the adhesions less or more than someone else, as long as we're not putting a bunch of bio glue all over the place. It's yeah, exactly. Patient disease. Yeah. yeah. No, thanks all very much for, for this conversation. I think it was extremely useful and I hope the uh, our viewers will enjoy it as well as, as much as we did. I think because I got the impression that you also loved it to have this discussion um, and something of course that we have been missing the last um, year very much. Hopefully we will get back to uh, the more normal situation around summer or after summertime and that uh, next year AATS will be back in person. So Mark, hopefully uh, I, I guess the AATS has similar kind of ideas that hopefully next year we will be uh, somewhere. D do you know what will be the location next year? It'll be Boston. Boston, Boston okay. yeah. Great, so, so that, 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 will be, that will be awesome to see each other uh, back again in, in, uh, in, in real person. So thanks all very much uh, for joining today and I um, hope uh, we will see each other back very soon. Take care, guys. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you to Medtronic. Thanks, Peter. Thank you.